The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. And we say hello to Julia Swig, New York Times bestselling author, scholar, and entrepreneur. She's also an internationally recognized authority on Latin America and U.S. foreign policy. Her most recent book, released to great critical acclaim, Lady Bird Johnson, Hiding in Plain Sight. Julia Swig, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. I'm delighted to be here with you, Jim. Thank you. You're quite welcome, and our pleasure to have you with us. You know, writing a book can easily take over an author's life. I probably don't have to tell you that. And it's clear that writing this book and the way it was written was an all-consuming task. Tell us a bit about the process of writing this book and why you decided to make the commitment. Well, the process, as you say, was a very long one. But it was clear to me very early on that I would need to make the commitment in order to do the subject justice because it turns out, and I didn't know this until I knew it, that Lady Bird Johnson left behind a huge trove of archival material at the LBJ Library in Austin, Texas. And I just knew right away it would take me a very long time to get through it, to do her justice, to place her into the LBJ presidency. And Principally, that's, but not just this, the 123 hours of audio tape that she recorded while she was in the White House, right? These are the other LBJ tapes. They weren't secretly recorded, but they are her, they are, that they form the basis of her enormous archival material. So the commitment then, you know, I think once I got into it, it stayed interesting to me. You know, I did have to comb through the material and that did take time. But listening to her, reading the transcripts, placing it in the context of all of the secondary material, literature, history written about LBJ, and seeing beat by beat how her story upended so much of the received wisdom, that kept my attention. What and foresight? Plus, you know, I'm not a quitter, so I had to finish. Right. <laughs> of course. I and mean, what foresight by by the first lady at that time to to to, to take the, the opportunity to make sure there's all this record of, of, of things. And, you know, you describe a woman who was both of her time and ahead of her time. Within the context of being a first lady, how were those two things true at the same time? Well, I think all of us have complexity and duality and mindsets that are shaped in one era, but then evolve over the, over the time of our lives. So I think that's not unique to her, but in her specific case, you know, she was born at the beginning of the 20th century. Her life spanned that whole century. She died in 2007. And so if you think about a woman born in the early part of the 20th century, who nevertheless is highly educated, you know, by the time she's in her young 20s, but doesn't see herself as a, where feminism is not part of her progressive vision, but she has a commitment to leveling the racial playing field. She's a New Deal Democrat who believes in the power of government to make lives better in a broadly capitalist society. She um, was not of her time by the 1960s. You know, she wasn't a person who called herself a feminist, for example, but there she was, very much a feminist in her own way. She later, over the course of her presidency, of the LBJ presidency, called herself an environmentalist, but that initially was couched in a euphemism called beautification. So this was about her consciousness about what the American public could digest in terms of what to expect from the person married to the president of the United States. 
Mm -hmm. In documenting the remarkable influence of Lady Bird Johnson within her husband's administration, how do you now understand her relationship with LBJ that created the space for that kind of influence? Well, that's an excellent question. And, you know, it's they she wrote something early on that I read at the beginning of this process. She wrote to another biographer who was writing about her at the time that it would be impossible to understand her or Lab or Lyndon other than as having their lives completely intertwined with one another. And that says to me, look, this is a long marriage with many layers of complexity. And it was ultimately a political enterprise and one of mutual interdependence. And that grew over time, over the course of his political career. I'm talking about a, a dynamic that most people would maybe recognize in a more modern era because we think about that marriage and that dynamic as one in which the big, powerful, mean LBJ played around on her, was publicly sometimes really kind of awfully abusive as the received wisdom goes. But when you peel back the layers, what you see is, in fact, an experience in which that focus on that aspect of the presidency really diminishes her of substance and deprives her of that role that they had of, of this joint enterprise that they were in for three decades together. Now, Lady Bird Johnson, as you touched on a moment ago, is is most well known for what became her defining issue, issue, which, as you said, they refer to as beautification. And as the Texas Observer states in their review of your book, she was about a lot more than wildflowers. What's important to understand about her approach to beautification and what she was really trying to accomplish? Well, I like to think about the evolution of her environmentalism and the way it was described to the public as going from the ornamental to the fundamental. So early on, you know, she took inspiration from the experience of Texas, which started beautifying its highways in the 1920s and 30s. Texas was a leader nationally in that. Um, by the time she gets to the White House in the 1960s, she has now been a resident of Washington, D.C. for the last 30 years, commuting between D.C. and, and, and Texas. And she um, comes at the issue initially focusing on that ornamental, planting flowers in the touristy and monumental part of Washington, D.C., promoting this Highway Beautification Act, which was a lot deeper and a lot more um, radical in a way than is given credit. But it moves to the fundamental in the sense that she tries to marry, especially in Washington, D.C., the issue of environmental justice, as we understand it today, with civil rights, and which what I like to think of as democratic access to nature for Washingtonians in the most underserved neighborhoods who are primarily Black and poor and totally underrepresented, unrepresented, if you will, in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Now, turning to LBJ's, Lyndon Johnson's defining issues, one of those, of course, is the Great Society. What did you learn in the course of writing this book about Lady Bird's influence on the evolution of the Great Society agenda? Well, the environmental component of LBJ's Great Society, I think, hasn't gotten the attention that the war on poverty and Head Start and the other health and literacy and educational components of it, because LBJ's environmentalism is pretty ambitious, and it's designed in part by Stuart Udall, who was JFK's Secretary of Interior, an emphasis on national parks, on clean water, on clean rivers, on protecting wilderness, on laying the groundwork for what later became the EPA under Nixon, on raising the public consciousness, and this is Lady Bird too, for what brought us Earth Day, et cetera. So one piece of her Great Society impact is on the environmental component. The other has to do, if we think broadly of civil rights as part of that Great Society, is that she was an active campaigner for it, especially in 1964, after the Civil Rights Act passed and they were going into the 1964 election. Lady Bird, who was raised in the South, whose family is from Alabama, who was more, much more of a of a, of a deep Southerner than a West Texaner in a sense, in terms of her, her orientation. She wanted to try to keep the South on the side of the Democratic Party. She didn't want to have the South lose 
to have the party lose the South by default because of just an assumption that white Southerners would not buy into leveling the racial playing field. So I think civil rights and her activism for it was a very big part. Um, there's a, of course Head Start, but that that's a an issue that that she's associated with that she actually didn't dive into quite as deeply. Um, as far as LBJ's commitment to the Great Society and civil rights, you know that was something that the two of them came into office. That was the the greatest domestic ambitions that they had was to deepen and expand the progressive vision of FDR. They were FDR New Deal Democrats, and they saw they it was in their DNA to try to expand what he had started. Mm -hmm. We're speaking to Julia Swig, New York Times bestselling author, scholar and entrepreneur, and her most recent book, Lady Bird Johnson, Hiding in Plain Sight. Um, elevating the power of women was a core commitment for Lady Bird Johnson. How did she change the norms about what we expect from not only a first lady, but women in any kind of powerful position? Well, this is an interesting question because it's a little harder to see. Um, she, as I said before, wouldn't have called herself during the years of the she was in the White House a feminist per se. But in her actions, what she was doing was trying to use her platform to elevate professional women and to make the point in her speeches and in her activism in terms of policy and the public outreach she did, that women had the right to participate fully in public life as activists, as citizens, as professionals. It was a kind of carefully modulated approach because she, I think also, and this goes to your earlier question about how could she be of our time and of the future as well. She was aware that the American public, that there that she could invite a backlash, right? In 1960, when she was on the campaign trail, she was spat upon by the mink coat mob in Dallas, Texas, um, who accused her and accused LBJ of being too, of being socialists and too radical. And so she was leery of, 1963 is when Betty Friedan's book, The, the Feminine Mystique um, is published. She doesn't see herself as a radical so she wants to sh show the spotlight on women as able to do it all in a way that's kind of phenomenal, right? But she never said it like, this is a feminist agenda and I'm gonna use the White House to point the light at that. She just showed it with who she spoke to, who she brought to the White House and um, what she said in the content of her speeches. Mm -hmm. You know, Julia, you've made the point that this is also a book about the way we understand our own history. It, what have we been missing and, and, and what's gained by capturing a fuller story? That's a gigantic question, Jim. Um, <laughs> well, what do we gain by tell me the first part of the question, if you don't mind. Just the point that you know, this is also a book about the way we understand our own history. Right. Well, first point, the story of, Amer of the American presidency has been told largely, I think mostly by men telling the story about male presidents. And in that, you know, to, to paraphrase a, a, a current phrase, in that male gaze, what we see are certain questions that are asked about the executive exercising his power with a tiny cabal of inner circle people in his cabinet in the West Wing, um, but really sort of being at the top of this hierarchy where the partner in the White House is subordinate. Mm. And therefore certain questions just haven't been asked. Certain historical resources and archival resources haven't been studied. I think that's one of the things that blew my mind about the LBJ presidency story is that this historical material was sitting at the LBJ library for a very long time and largely sneezed past by the lie, almost everyone who wrote about that presidency. So when you ask the question about how did the partner in the White House shape X presidency? And that's a question we were talking before that really hasn't been asked. You get a, a much more complicated and more um, layered view of 
up any presidency, certainly of this one. So I think the, the second part of your question, why does this matter, is simply that we need to know who we are as a nation, what made up the what makes up the fabric of our society, who we were, how we got to this moment and who we're becoming. And I think that's always some that's a iterative process, right? There's never going to be one definitive answer to that. Right. But it certainly matters for how we think of ourselves in our society today and where we're going tomorrow. You know, it seems to me that it, it, it as you think about this and, and you think about that time, um, and as you said, it was men talking about men, basically, uh, in, in the executive office. And only half the story has ever been told about so many first ladies, but and especially uh, Lady Bird Johnson. True. And I, I don't I wouldn't you know, I'm not a first lady historian, so I'm not prepared to say that each first lady that we've ever had has had as significant a, an influence in shaping her husband's presidency, this will certainly change when we have a female president right. because automatically you'll have permission given to have a whole new set of people telling her story. And that's going to generate a much more sophisticated and layered understanding of our, of that history. Mm -hmm. Now, so many of the issues that the Johnson administration fought for in terms of civil rights and the role of government in helping people create a better life are still being fought today. Uh, as a historian, do you see us any closer to resolving these battles than we were in the 1960s? Hmm. Well, um, one of the things that I observed, of course, and lived through while writing this book was the vulnerability of our society to having its worst aspects stoked and brought to the surface. And so when we experience the racial reckoning in this country that we're still undertaking, of course, I think about the 1960s and this notion that the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and then the Fair Housing Act of 1968 were kind of the end of the story. This notion that maybe primarily white Americans had that, that, okay, problem solved, <laughs> you know, now we can, now we can just move forward as one as whole, but no, our, our, yes, I think we're closer. I think we're closer than we were in 1958. We became, we were closer by 1968, but I think what we've learned in the last few years is, is that the structural institutional racial and economic divide that are totally deeply intertwined have such deep roots. And I think that's where you get kind of, you think about the liberal reformist ethos of the 1960s, really not fully understanding the depth of the influence of enslaving so many people, not just on those people and their descendants, but on all of us. Mm -hmm. So are we closer? Yes, we are. Our public consciousness has been raised, but we're far from done. Uh, is it fair to say that we're not as close as we perhaps thought? Oh, it's a hundred percent fair to say we're not as close as we thought. And if we had this conversation 10 years from now, um, after my next book, I, mean, I think, I think, I hope that we'll be a little bit closer in the future than, than, than we are by comparison to 40 years ago. Well, we certainly look forward to that next book. I'm I'm sorry that it's going to take another 10 years, but Well, we, I hope we, it doesn't. We, Maybe it'll right. might be my next two books. Right. That would be wonderful. Julia Swag, New York Times best-selling author, author of her most most recent book is Lady Bird Johnson: Hiding in Plain Sight. Julia, thank you so much for your time with us today. We do look forward to having you back again sooner than 10 years. Thank you very much, Jim. It's been great to be with you today. And you as well. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this America's Democrats dot org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. 
let me say one word to you, nuts. Now, let me say one name to you, Ted Cruz. They've become synonymous with the Texas lawmaker perennially topping national lists of goofy right-wing political goobers. Only, Ted can't rightly be called a lawmaker, for he's not a serious participant in that process. Instead, devoting his senatorship to political stunts and picking silly PR fights with a growing list of enemies. Running out of people to attack, Ted has found another species for his vitriol, fictional icons. He's been padding his right-wing credentials by going after Mr. Potato Head, Mickey and Pluto, and, believe it or not, Muppets. This U.S. senator has dedicated the power and public resources of his office to demonize popular creatures on Sesame Street, specifically Big Bird and lovable little Elmo. Ted rants he has proof that Muppets are covert tools of, quote, government propaganda. So this ridiculous excuse of a senator is saving America from Muppets. But for a whole bag of assorted nuttiness, you can't beat Senator Rick Scott's 11-point plan to rescue America. A disgraced former health care mogul, this mega-millionaire reinvented himself as a wingnut Florida senator, and he now chairs a policy arm of the Republican Party. In February, he set forth a stunning agenda of far-out right-wing extremism, that he says his party will push if they retake the Senate this November, including, one, implementing new federal taxes on the poorest half of Americans, two, terminating Social Security and Medicare, three, completing Donald Trump's folly of a border wall. This is Jim Hightower saying, fiddle-faddlers like Cruz and Scott have turned the once-proud U.S. Senate into the little nut shop on the hill. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to Hightowerlowdown.org. This social security measure, I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. Congratulations on the new book, and uh, welcome back to the uh, Bill Press Pod, uh, which you're a regular guest today now. Hi, Gabe. Yeah, it's great to be uh, in this version of the Bill Press Pod, and thank you very much. So the new book, The Long Alliance, The Imperfect Union of Joe Biden and Barack Obama. Wonderful book. I enjoyed every word of it. I think you did a great job um, uh, detailing their relationship and explaining it. Uh, and I so, Gabe... Here's the deal. I finished the book, and this is last week. I pick up the Washington Post the next morning. It happens to be Wednesday, September 7. The morning, the Obamas are coming back to the White House for the unveiling of their official presidential and first lady portraits at the White House, which is, uh, of course, going to be a glorious, joyous day. And the headline in the Washington Post is, Tensions linger between the Obama and Biden camp. <laughs> I, I just want to read you a couple of sentences from this story by Tyler Pager, uh, last Wednesday's Washington Post. Quote, beneath that jovial atmosphere is long simmering tension and even some jealousy between the circles around Obama and Biden. 
Some Biden loyalists are resentful that Obama didn't throw his weight behind Biden's presidential aspirations, complaining that even now Obama's team does not fully respect Biden. Obama loyalists are frustrated that Biden's aides regularly boast of how they have avoided the mistakes of the Obama White House, such as failing to sufficiently tout the president's accomplishments. Gabe, this is the subject of your book, right? This tension between the Obamas and the Biden. Is it for real? Well, I don't remember exactly what my tweet said, but after I saw that story post uh, last Tuesday night, I think I said, Something along the lines of, if you like this story, boy, have I got the book for you. <laughs> um, uh, so I, you know, obviously sent out the pre-order link. But listen, yes, that's the that's the story here. Um, to back up for just one second. Um, yeah. I think it's an important thing to note here that, okay, everyone, certainly who's listening to this, everyone who cares about them, knows the bromance story. They're very close. And it is, in fact, true, I found, by talking to hundreds of their friends, allies, associates, whatever, that their relationship is genuinely as close as any between a president and vice president was in modern history, and certainly between a president and former president. Okay, now let's pivot. All of that said, they are wildly different men. But not a bromance, right, as such? It is just simply not a bromance. Yeah. Uh, they are wildly different men from wildly different worlds. They're close, but the idea that this is some uncomplicated friendship is just, it's not reality. And it never has been. And it never has been. So these days, what Tyler in the Washington Post wrote uh, the other, you know, the other day, that's all true. And to this day, one of the big discomforts is that neither side will really admit to the other that this like mm -hmm. lingering tension does exist. It's not totally obvious that there's this amount of direct tension between the two men themselves, simply because they have other things to worry about. But it is right. also true that their relationship is nowhere near as close as it has been at various times in the past. They still talk on occasion, um, but their conversations are not really about politics or policy. They're more just catch up and general general kinds of conversation. But right. I think, do think that the most uh, important or pointed part of this is this conversation about how Biden and people around him often talk about how they learned the lessons of the Obama years and how they're trying to do things differently. To a lot of people who are close to Obama, uh, this is sort of annoying, not because they disagree. They obviously think that Biden is doing mm -hmm. things you know, based on lessons that he learned, but because to them, they're like, well, yeah, that's the whole point. Of course he's doing that. If he, That was the whole point of voting for him in the first place. That's what the presidency is. Obama always says the presidency is a relay race. You know, we got to pick up from where the per previous guy left off. So the idea to a lot of Obama people that Biden is doing something novel, it's maddening to them. On the other hand, it's definitely true that there are people in Biden world who, for example, when Obama came by the White House uh, in April, I believe, and said, you know, made a joke calling Biden vice right. president. Vice Biden, president. Mm hmm. You know, yeah. Biden laughed loudly as if to say, oh, ho, ho, I'm in on this joke. And of course he is. It's not a very complicated joke. And, you know, it's the most obvious thing in the world to say. But there are people around him who, who say, you know, come on, like, ha show some respect. This is the commander in chief. And that does linger. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, you know, through your book, um, you talk several times about the tension between the two camps. But I came away with the impression, and maybe from this story, too, that the tension is more on the part of staffers than the two men themselves. Do you agree? There's no doubt that there's been real tension between the two of them, especially when they saw the world very differently at different times over, especially their time yeah. in office. But certainly in the run up to the 2016 campaign, when, you know, maybe yeah. we'll talk about this, but when Obama essentially picked Hillary Clinton over Joe Biden, and even in the run up to 2020, when mm -hmm. Obama said, listen, he wasn't going to dissuade Biden, but he was pretty clear that he didn't wasn't sure it was a good idea for Biden to run and that he was going to be neutral. But in terms of the camps, this is a conversation that goes back all the way to their earliest days together. You know, look at what happened during their 2008 campaign. Yeah. They had known each other in the Senate, but this was the first time that they had really worked on a common project together, the campaign, once Obama chose Biden. And almost immediately, Biden and some of the people around Obama clashed because Biden felt that he wasn't being taken seriously, that they didn't understand the kind of politics that he was trying to do. You know, literally from the first speech they handed him as running mate, he took the speech, took a red pen and rewrote it for an hour or two. <laughs> and then you had, you know, David Axelrod and David Clough looking at him saying, what are we getting ourselves into here? Uh, there's a, you know, a fun moment 
uh, some of this is, was was known at the time, but a lot of it wasn't about how essentially they put Biden on a teleprompter after he went off off message a few times. But his whole argument was, you guys don't understand what I'm trying to do with appealing voters. And he would he would vent and vent to his aides, you know, some of which he had to fight to even be allowed to take on the plane with him because the Obama people didn't trust mm-hmm. him. And, and sometimes he would get on these rants and Ted Kaufman, his longest running confidant, would one, you know, let him vent for a bit. And then he would say, you know, I need you, uh, Joe, Senator, to remember uh, three words, Air Force Two. And that's how he would ground him as if to say, listen, we've got bigger things to worry about. Here. Right. So uh, first of all, I want to uh, um, make sure I understand from your introduction to the book, you uh, requested, uh, but were not granted an interview with Joe Biden or Barack Obama to in writing the book, correct? Uh, yeah, I, I tried for many months to talk to both of them, um, talk to many, many, many people close to both of them, but was never able to talk to either of them. So let, let's go back to the beginning. When did these two guys first connect? Well, the first time that they really got a sense of each other was 2004. So that's mm-hmm. the presidential election pitting John Kerry against George Bush. Uh, Biden had been in the Senate for a very long time, and he was convinced that he was going to be John Kerry's secretary of state. In fact, as I report in the book, Kerry essentially offered him the job. Yeah. So he's got other things on his mind when Obama at the convention shows up and, you know, blows the roof off the place. Everyone says, who is this guy? Right after the convention, Obama is flying back from Boston Logan Airport to Chicago and is getting mobbed at the airport. So he slips into the American Airlines lounge to sort of get some mm-hmm. get some space. He gets a phone call and his campaign manager slips out to, to take a deep breath and try and understand what is going on now that his client is the most famous person on earth. And he runs into the Bidens. And Joe Biden gives him some advice. And he says, listen, and he's talking to Jimmy Colley, Obama's campaign manager here. He says, listen. And he looks like he's about to impart the most incredible piece of advice in history. But he essentially just says, this guy is not going to you know, have everything handed to him on a platter in the Senate. He has to be a workhorse, not a show horse. You know, keep his head down, do the policy work. Now, this is extremely conventional wisdom advice. But of course, the way that Biden delivers it, it's like, uh, you know, only a 40 year veteran of the Senate could possibly know this stuff. But <laughs> Kali understands what's happening here. You know, Biden is essentially saying mm-hmm. this guy, you know, might be a celebrity, but we've seen celebrities come and go. You know, you got to handle this the right way. In the Senate, they get to know each other a little bit because Obama joins Biden's foreign relations committee. But even then, you know, Biden is the chairman, he's the most senior member. Uh, Obama is the most junior member. And so they don't really have a lot of one on one interactions. They have some. But to the extent that they're aware of each other, you know, Biden is in his own world trying to be the Democratic counterweight to uh, the Bush White House, especially on Iraq and Afghanistan. And and Obama is watching him just thinking, oh, my God, this guy is quite the bloviator. And even in their first conversation, you know, on the Senate, you can see that they're really not seeing eye to eye. Biden invites Obama over to have a conversation when Obama asks to be on the committee. They have a fine little chat. And then Biden says, you know, uh, this is all well and good, but let's have a real like, get to know each other meal, you know, in the Capitol when we're both in town. Yeah. And 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 uh, Biden says, let's just go to some cheap Italian place. And Obama <laughs> is taken aback and he sort of sees this as who does this guy think he is? You know, I'm a senator now. Not only that, Obama was now had money for the first time in his life because of a book deal. And he says, you know, we can go someplace nicer than that. I can afford it. <laughs> that is 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 horrible if you ask joe biden because biden his whole shtick is i'm you know regular joe i don't have any money and he sees obama and he goes who does this guy think he is you know who is this guy who's talking about how he can spend money on a big dinner i can't so they both walk away with no plans to go to dinner and not really understanding each other at all so starting from there uh f- flash forward to 2008 we know the whole story we don't have to go into all of that with obama uh, you know, harry reed basically telling him to run obama's not really happy in the white house uh, I, I mean in in the senate so he decides to go to the to run for president but what drove him then to joe biden whom he always thought talked too much uh his vice presidential running mate well, part of it was just the, you know, again, the conventional wisdom that he needed someone older with Capitol Hill experience, with foreign policy experience, who mm-hmm. literally had gray hair. I mean, that was literally something that they had written down as something that they wanted to have. Um, and Biden had not had run a good campaign at all. Right. But Obama had actually come to realize during their debates that Biden, though he was basically being ignored, was saying stuff of substance that he obviously knew his stuff. 
Um, though Obama had been annoyed by how much Biden was talking in the Senate, he also saw that he clearly had some political, he, he liked his political instincts and that he, he didn't know the policy. But um, the fact that Obama zeroed in early on Biden as one of the people to take seriously really wasn't a surprise to anyone at the time because he was on every short list. You know, he was yeah. the obvious person for someone like like a young, untested candidate like Obama. That said, um, it wasn't as obvious as it seemed. You know, there was there's one moment where Obama calls Bill Richardson and asks him to vet him. And Bill Richardson says, yeah, but why are we going through this? You're obviously going to choose Biden. But Biden, you know, wasn't so sure that he wanted to do it. because right. he, he, thought was, he, he, he was rather reluctant. Biden was right. That's I mean, right. He sort of said, I've never had a boss in my life. And this guy who's 20 years younger than me and all his eggheads are going to be my boss. And mm-hmm. he also thought maybe he could be secretary of state. But anyway, Obama eventually wears him down and says, you know, I promise you, you can be a full partner. Um, but even then, in the final interviews, Obama does three final interviews, one with Biden, one with Tim Kaine, who's then the governor of Virginia, and one with Evan Bayh. Now, Bayh is a senator, former governor, who, you know, is is a boring choice, but would be a fine one. But Obama is not taking him as seriously as the other two. In his conversation with Kaine, Kaine essentially says, you know, I don't know if you should choose me. We're too similar. And that's what a lot of people around Obama had been saying, too, because Cain was also then at the time mm-hmm. seen as this young, inspiring liberal from Harvard. OK, that's what Obama was, too. And Obama says to Cain, yeah, you're the choice of my heart, but Biden is the choice of my head. And the problem is that sometimes I listen to my heart and sometimes I listen to my head. <laughs> but here's the thing. We know that Obama listens to his head and so does Joe Biden. And so that's how he ended up with it. Uh what were there any conditions that Biden placed on Obama or that uh, for accepting the job? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as soon as he realized that he was going to be taken seriously, uh, Biden and his his aide Ted Kaufman rang up uh, Walter Mondale, the former vice president, and his chief of staff Dick Mo, and they said. You know, they recognized Biden had seen a lot of presidents and vice presidents during his time in Washington and knew Mondale pretty well and had recognized that Mondale was by far the most influential Democratic vice president that he'd seen. And he really did reshape the office. So they asked for advice and and what they were told and then what they took to Obama was got to make sure that every piece of paper that crosses the president's desk, you know, the vice president has access to. Got to make sure that you have regular lunches, regular meals, regular meetings. And most importantly, you have to make sure that the vice president is the final guy in the room for every mm-hmm. big conversation, for every big conversation, every big decision. Biden essentially takes these to Obama. And to his surprise, Obama says, yeah, sounds good. You know, Obama's starting to get the sense that there's a lot going on in the world and that this is going to he's really going to need his vice president's help one way or the other. And Biden's sort of taken aback by how easily Biden or Obama you know, agrees to all these things. But. Then Obama has a condition for Biden and says, you know, if I want you to do this, if you do this, I need this to be the capstone of your career. And uh-huh. Biden <laughs> looks back at him and says, oh, not the tombstone. So that conversation, <laughs> that though not great. explicitly, is understood by both of them to mean, well, you're not going to run for president after this. And right. if you look back at the New York Times' story, the day that Joe Biden is picked, one of the final paragraphs says something that's the effect of, one of the great things that Obama has done here is choose someone who's not going to cause him any political headaches because he's too old to run for president in 2016. Of course, that's not how things worked out, but that is right. certainly the understanding that they had uh, on that, you know, that that day in Minneapolis when they first met uh, secretly. So once they are uh, sworn in, they're in the White House, the, the working relationship, they did stick to their weekly lunches, uh, as you report. Um, obviously, they were not always in town at the same time. Um, uh, there, there was you, you also report, Gabe, there was one thing that Obama wanted, which was loyalty, right? That Joe Biden might disagree with his decisions, but and Biden promised he would always support whatever the president's decision was, even if he just disagreed with it. Was there ever any time when Biden broke that rule uh, that and was disloyal to Obama? Yeah, well, not only that, but the second part of it was that Obama really wanted him to make sure, wanted to make sure, wanted to get the, the, the commitment that not only would Biden go along with it, but that he wouldn't then leak or wouldn't, uh-huh. you know, get yeah. it out there that he didn't agree with this. So, you know, there were certainly times where it was well known that Biden and Obama were not on the same page. Some of them are famous. You look at, for example, the uh, raid to, to uh, the raid of, of Obama, Osama bin Laden 
Um, obviously, Biden was known at the time to be the most hesitant person in the room on that, though later he'd sort of changed his tune on it. What wasn't so known at the time was he was very, very skeptical on a lot of things. For example, uh, Obama really wanted to push on a health care reform measure, you know, what became Obamacare almost immediately. But of course, mm-hmm. the economy was falling apart at the time and Biden was wildly skeptical. He was going around saying, I know Capitol Hill. I know politics. You know, we're going to we're kneecapping ourselves if we're going to try and do this. This is historically a political loser. And over time, he realized that he just was not going to win this one. So he sort of shut up. But he was not, therefore, central to the Obamacare push because it was known that he had other things that he cared about more that he thought were a better idea to focus on. Another one was the uh, debate over the war in Afghanistan, which Mm -hmm. was a massive protracted conversation between Obama and Biden, but also between military leadership, you know, Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, um, Biden from the start almost said, we got to get out of Afghanistan. You know, he didn't put it in those terms, but he was trying to argue for as few troops sent in as possible while Obama was hearing arguments from generals, uh, David Petraeus, Stanley McChrystal, to massively ramp up. Obama at one point asks Biden to try and make sure that he's really pressure testing the general's arguments. And Biden goes all in and essentially starts making the argument in these, in these you know, repeat repeated meetings in the Oval Office, in the Situation Room. What are we doing here? We need to change our strategy entirely. And it became obvious to people that even though, you know, Obama had asked him to play this role, that he really felt this way, that he was really upset about the way that, you know, the military was strong arming in his eyes, Obama to, to, uh, you know, massively ramp up investment and and troop size, uh, troop levels in Afghanistan. And how about the same-sex marriage question? That was the one time, right, that publicly uh, Obama, I mean, Biden broke with Obama. That was by far the most prominent one. So that's right. People might remember this. This is 2012 heading into their re-election campaign. There have been conversations in the Oval Office, and Biden knew about at least some of them, about how Obama was going to roll out the idea that he was now in support of same-sex marriage. Um, Obama had come to this conclusion over time, but wanted to be careful about how he talked about it. Um, He didn't want to be seen as too obviously political about it, though, of course, it was a political conversation. Um, And he wanted to be careful, you know, in swing states and places with uh, some socially conservative voters that he thought he could still be competing for. And his advisors were very wary about that. So they had planned this whole rollout um, with interviews scheduled and and they hadn't set, set any specific time. Anyway, uh, Biden is set to go and meet the press uh, in May of 2012 to lay out a little bit about the, uh, the, the re-election campaign. It's supposed to be a pretty uneventful um, conversation. And for the most part, it is until he's asked about same-sex marriage. And he effectively goes ahead and endorses it. And this is a massive moment for this, for the, you know, for, mm-hmm. uh, for civil rights, for gay rights. It's a, it's a massive moment. And Obama is essentially furious because not because he disagrees with Biden, but because he feels that Biden has gone ahead, getting, gotten ahead of him, even though he knew that, Bi- that Obama was trying to uh, roll this out at some point. You know, within the West Wing, there was real fury among some aides who felt like Biden was just, you know, getting over his skis, trying to look better than Obama. And some people around Biden thought that maybe he was trying to pressure Obama. Obama got mad at him in person and said, listen, like, I understand, but come on, man, you're making us look bad here. Right. Biden ended up sort of uh, not apologizing because, of course, he felt strongly about it. But he, he you know, took a backseat for a little bit and was, in fact, sidelined uh, when it came to campaigning for a few weeks. But behind the scenes, he and his son, Bo, actually rewatched the footage over and over and over because they were so proud of it. You know, Biden felt that he had really taken an important stand, but also that he'd pressured the, the rest of the administration to do the same. It was rumored at the time. Is there any truth that Obama considered replacing Biden for 2012 as his running mate, maybe re- replacing him with Hillary Clinton? When Jim Messina took over as the campaign manager for that election uh, in you know, a year earlier, one of the things that he and some others high up in the White House and high up in that political operation did was start a series of focus groups and polls to basically test every proposition about the White House, uh, personnel, policy, communications. Among the questions that were asked was not explicitly, but uh, implicitly the question of who the vice president, who the running mate should be. Never did they test the question, should we get rid of Joe Biden? Should we replace him with Hillary Clinton? But they did test the images. They did test some versions of that question. And so 
what what started to happen was that a version of this started to leak out. Now, this is a conversation that happens every four years, as you well know, Bill, in Washington, right. and it's never real. So Biden was furious that the White House wasn't doing more to bat down this idea. Um, and he eventually, you know, went to folks in the White House and said, what's going on here? Now, Obama said publicly, there's nothing to it. There's nothing to it. But Biden said, why did this take quite so long? And essentially what he was told was, listen, it's true that there's nothing to it. It's true that we're not going to do it. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't shape up a little bit. And here's the fact of the matter. It, it, it did uh, the polling did not find that it would have been useful to replace him with Hillary Clinton. It would have been seen as weak, and her image was not all that much better than his when you know viewed in this political prism. At the same time, there was a lot of question because Biden at that point still wasn't seen as this obvious partner for Obama in the way that he later came to be seen, and he was not obviously helping them a lot politically. So there was this strange internal moment where Biden sort of said, "What do I? You know, what did these guys really think of me?" Um, and it was a passing moment, but it was definitely right. a real one. Well, then you get into 2012, uh, and uh, Biden, Biden's still on ticket. They're running through the campaign. And the first debate comes up with Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, which Obama really blew. Uh, and as you point out, that's kind of when Joe Biden saved their bacon, right? By uh, He had to have a strong performance against Paul Ryan, uh, and he delivered and got the campaign back on track. Oh, yeah. And he had been practicing uh, for a long time to debate against Paul Ryan. And they'd already decided, basically, that the best way to do it was not to engage in terms of policy, though to do that on occasion. But primarily, the best way to do it was essentially to bulldoze Paul Ryan. Now, uh, <laughs> Biden did not think that Paul was not impressed by Paul Ryan, who was trying to style himself as some sort of conservative policy wonk. But basically what they determined the best way to do this was to just be as blustery as possible, to interrupt Ryan constantly, to talk about how he didn't know what he was talking about, how he was completely untested, how Obama was the best president in history and Romney wanted to, you know, was a vulture capitalist and so on and so forth. Uh, Obama's people were thrilled when they saw this. And Obama himself called Biden after the debate and said, Thanks. You saved it. You saved us. Now, I think that's a little bit uh, it's a little bit overplayed, this idea that Biden is the reason they won in 2012. But it is definitely true that after that first debate, which was notoriously terrible for Obama, their numbers, uh, the, the internal numbers did tighten a lot. And yeah. after the Biden debate, once things really got into the fall, they started to loosen up a bit again. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.